Uh, so ahead of the lecture, I started reading more about Whitaker, about his life and work. So, I mean, of course, I've heard about Whitaker. Uh, I'm currently working on a paper with uh, Shota Nimoto and Rami Taklubigash, where we use Whitaker models, automorphic forms. But uh, reading sort of in more detail, looking at obituaries written by several colleagues, uh, uh, what transpires is that Whitaker had an amazing breadth of interest in mathematics and beyond. So I've learned, for example, well, that uh, in grammar school, he was ready for every prank, a natural actor. As a member of the Royal Society, he was a marvelous raconteur with a great fund of academic anecdotes at his disposal. And he could enliven the proceedings in a very acceptable manner. Uh, so he was also uh, the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and rendered devoted service to the society carried out his duties with much dignity and grace. And a particularly memorable address was one on the general topic of spin in the universe, a very timely topic indeed, and well worth studying, uh, as pointed out. Also, he had a very peculiar facility for coining names for concepts and uh, uh, entities, for example, he coined the following mathematical term, calamoids, that's calamity. So, uh, so that's him. Uh, you know, among his interests, his very early interests were, uh, as uh, I pointed out here, on interpolation. Um, and uh, how did he learn about it? Well, he, you know, uh, the existence uh, of a small number of papers is uh, due to the fact that Edinburgh is one of the chief centers of life insurance. Now, I'm not sure with, I don't know if this is still the case, but uh, in any event, so he was very uh, outgoing and formed friendships and then started thinking about these problems. Now, uh, some other uh, topics uh, in his early papers. Uh, so here he is looking at uh, the following equation. An algebraic form of genus two can be brought by birational transformation into the normal form that we all recognize, a double cover of P1 ramified and well, as you can see. And so Whitaker proved that to uniformize this, uh, well, you can uniformize it by some transcendental functions, quotient of solutions, differential equations, things like this. Now, uh, so here's just a list of what he did, uh, automorphic functions, astronomy, potential theory, dynamics, quantum theory. He wrote the very influential books, um, philosophy of science and history. Now, seeing such a wide range of topics, uh, one has to wonder, you know, how did he decide to move from one topic to another, from here to there? Of course, apart from talking to his colleagues uh, and friends, and uh, uh, well, I think one of the beauties of mathematics is to see, discover sort of unexpected connections between things that are seem seemingly quite unrelated, unrelated subjects. And so in my talk today, uh, I wanted to show you some examples how these sort of connections arise and well, let's go from here. So my initial interests were you know, look at solutions of the Fountain equations, you know, some easy ones. Uh, elliptic curves, cubic surfaces, you can look at homogeneous and non-homogeneous equations, and then they talk about rational points or integral points. Uh, so some well-known equations, Euler's conjecture, that this thing has no non-trivial solutions as rationals. Uh, there's a counterexample for n equals five, and Noam Elke has found uh, that for n equals four, not only are the counterexample, but the solutions are actually dense and the smallest solution, not so easy to get, it's this. So, uh, all right, uh, famous examples that went through the press recently, uh, we look at uh, equations like this, uh, sum of cubes, uh, no solutions in the integers for easy you know, congruence reasons. Uh, you see uh, the right hand side is plus minus one mod. Uh, four mod nine, but uh, for a long time, the 
following was open. What happens for like C equals 33? So Booker found this, and then Booker and Sutherland uh, harnessed the uh, power, I don't know, half a billion computers uh, worldwide and uh, massively distributed effort, uh, millions of CPU hours, years, I don't know. They got this solution. So uh, what do we learn from these examples? That uh, simple equations, uh, you know, difficult to solve. Uh, solutions seem to be sporadic, appear out of nowhere. Uh, there seems it's clearly a co connection to you know, complexity theory, computer science. Once you have a solution, you put it in to your equation. It's easy to verify that it's the solution. It's hard to find. Uh, there are often hidden structures, uh, hidden symmetries, like a group law and elliptic curves. And then the way we think about uh, the Ophantan equations is that it's this rigid lattice uh, in high dimensional space. And then they have this uh, variety, which we think of geometry. And how does the lattice interact with geometry? I mean, this is the most interesting things. So I wanted to show you some plots. Some of you may have seen this, rational points on cubic surfaces. So here are some singular ones, uh, another one. So now what can we learn from such plots? I mean, what do we see? So uh, there is, of course, an abundance of concrete computational results. Uh, people run nice experiments with concrete equations. Uh, but uh, there has to be some organizing principle. And the principle that emerged is the principle geometry. Now, you know, most of you know that basic algebraic geometry. I wasn't sure what the audience would be. So I'm just to recall, we look at uh, systems of homogeneous polynomial equations with coefficients in some field, let's say the rationals. And uh, geometry typically concerns properties of algebraically closed fields, typically when the field is a complex numbers. The questions uh, that arise, well, we want to introduce invariants, discrete and continuous invariants, uh, among discrete, the dimension, degree, continuous, moduli, you want to classify based on some global geometric invariance. And uh, we study you know, singularities. We look at additional structures such as vibrations, families of sub varieties, for example, families of lines. So here are some more pictures. Uh, and uh, uh, what do we do in arithmetic? So in arithmetic, we study rational points, non-trivial solutions of the system such equations. And the fields of interest uh, to us uh, uh, finite fields, rationals, functional field um, of uh, curves, uh, or you know, even more general fields. And uh, what do we want to understand? Existence of points, and well, the next sort of question of interest, density and various topologies, typically the risky topology, are the points confined to some proper sub-varieties. And so here we want to establish you know, connections between arithmetic and geometry, looking at geometric invariance, we'd like to predict the typical arithmetic behavior and so on. So let me just briefly go through uh, classification schemes. Uh, uh, so here is one sort of based on degree, low degree, intermediate degree, high degree. Uh, the high degree is sort of wide open world. Uh, you write down anything of degree bigger than the num number of variables. And you know these things are very complicated. So uh, when we talk about rational points, are mostly interested in varieties of degree, let's say less than the number of variables or equal to the number of variables. Okay. Another type of uh, classification that plays a role. Well, uh, we all know that uh, you have some system of equations. You do substitutions, uh, uh, change coordinates, and then you get a different system. Uh, so, well, how can you compare them? Equations may look very, very different. So you would like to understand how close your variety is to sort of a reference variety in the projective space. And uh, the notions that have emerged is being birational to projective space, so that rationality of your variety, stable rational, so that your variety times the projective space is birational to projective space, or unirationality dominated by Pn. 
And so if you're rational, you're stably rational, you're also really rational, but um, the converse is not necessarily true. Now, the connection to arithmetic questions is as follows. If uh, you know that you're dominated by projective space, well, then you understand rational points in the projective space. And so in particular, your rationality over your field will imply the risky density over your field. And uh, again, to emphasize, so these properties very much depend on the ground field. So let's look at this conic. Uh, there are no points over the rationals, so it is not rational over the, over the rationals. And uh, on the other hand, you change the sign and then you are rational. And so that's the picture that the Greeks understood. Uh, and that's the algebra behind this. So you look at this equation, you know how to parameterize solutions this time, not by transcendental functions, but rather by rational functions in one variable. And uh, well, that's, that's what makes a conic rational that you can parameterize it like this. So what do we know? Over the complex numbers, uh, the notions of rationality, unirationality, stable rationality, uh, in dimension up to two coincide in dimension at least three of the complex numbers or uh, dimension two, they're not necessarily the same. Um, quadric surface is rational. It's uh, you do the same thing as photoconic, you pick a point and then you start drawing lines. Uh, a cubic with a point over your field is unirational, but not always stably rational or rational. There are effective procedures to determine the rationality of a cubic surface over Q. So you just put it on a computer and you can figure out when you have rationality. But there are no effective procedures right now to determine whether or not a cubic surface over Q has a Q rational point. I think that's quite a, an interesting uh, problem to look at, but I think it's no. So let's discuss uh, uh, case three surfaces are not unirational in characteristic zero. Uh, so here is an example, uh, double cover of uh, not P1 as considered by Whitaker, but P2 uh, ramified in a curve of degree six. Uh, you don't know still are rational points but potentially dense on a, such a surface. Uh, we can do numerics and Elden Hans and Jano uh, looked at uh, this example that was uh, suggested by the late Sonnet and Dyer. Um, and uh, they found that there are indeed uh, uh, non trivial solutions, but uh, you know, the only one up to uh, science is the one written here, and it's quite large. So, and what do we conjecture? What do we think? I mean, you might think there are actually the risky depths in this case. So uh, when you study uh, sort of rational points, you think, okay, well, maybe uh, their distribution uh, has to do with uh, uh, curves of low degree, like lines, conics, uh, you know, rational curves. So this particular one has 48 lines over Q bar. Um, then you could ask, well, what about curves of uh, higher degree? So a beautiful formula that emerged uh, from, I guess, mathematical physics. Initially, uh, you count the number of rational uh, curves uh, of degree D, you know, nodal curves on a case three surface. And the yao zastler formula uh, tells you that this generating function, well, it actually has this close form. And let's look at this 24 here, 24. So, okay. You think now you understand something. This is a classical uh, you know, function on the right side of this equation. So the coefficients, they grow. You think, okay, well, maybe this ND, that number grows, of course, as well. So maybe this is a way to show that your K3 surface has infinitely many rational curves. But that's not so straightforward. And so uh, Bogomolov and, and I, we looked at this and proved that uh, actually uh, an elliptic K3 surface will contain infinitely many rational curves. K3 surfaces always have some rational curves. 
but other infinitely many. And we also proved that rational points are potentially dense, even though, again, it is not a unirational variety, but there are other ways to propagate rational points. So then the question remained, uh, what about you know, general case three surfaces? And uh, uh, by now work of many people, we know that uh, indeed the uh, uh, K3 surface of algebraically closed field of characteristic zero does contain infinitely many rational curves. So the last papers here uh, are quite recent and I think probably still unpublished, but um, this is what we have. Uh, what Bogomolov, Brandon Hassett and myself are able to do is to establish this for a degree two uh, K3 surface, for all degree two K3 surfaces. Um, you know, okay, so uh, now, what about higher dimensions? So, uh, or, or other fields? So in general, it's quite difficult to prove or disprove the existence of a rational parameterization. So you look at this singular cubic surface, it's straightforward how to parameterize this. It's a toric variety. So you just put in your things and it works. Now you look at the diagonal cubic surface, a smooth one, and Noam Elkis produced these formulas. Uh, of course, you can't guess them just algebraically. You have to have a geometric idea uh, how to arrive at such formulas. And um, nevertheless, I mean, this is what it is. So plus minus one, plus minus two is coefficients. Um, then you ask yourself, okay, suppose we change one of the coefficients, like instead of one, 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 we look at one, 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 two as coefficients. And then what happens is that actually there is no uh, rational parameterization over the rationals, over Q. And where are the abstractions? Well, the abstractions are, you know, well hidden in Gallo cohomology, Gallo action on the 27 lines on the Picard group and cohomological abstractions uh, to uh, rationality. So uh, to summarize, there is sort of very, very, very extensive literature on rationality uh, focused on computable birational invariants, studies of families of algebraic varieties. As I said, well, you look at surfaces, you look at threefolds in some families. Uh, and uh, it, sort of one of the beautiful things about the well-posed question is that uh, every advance leads you to uh, what is followed by or is made, made possible by the introduction of uh, sort of new ideas, new techniques that then uh, either develop in, in the new branches of geometry or uh, have you know, big impact on those, like minimal model program, almost a billion and a billion geometry program. Uh, so all of these things are so rationality. Uh, I want to mention some spectacular recent developments. Uh, uh, new technique, new idea introduced by Vozan, developed by Kolyot, Talan, and Perutka, with uh, follow-up work by you know, many others. Uh, the observation that rationality and stable rationality can be studied via uh, specialization, via considerations of families of such varieties. And so in sort of most recent form, uh, the statement is, well, a family of stable rational varieties with multi singularities, say if the generic fiber is stable rational and so is the special fiber. And so Maxim Kunsevich and I uh, were able to generalize sort of the argument of Nikias and Schindler uh, looking at, uh, you know, rationality and approving specialization of rationality. So in terms of vocabulary, so the invariants that we introduce, uh, the group, the Burnside group, it's a free abelian group spent by classes, by rational classes of varieties. So classes of varieties, modulo uh, the rationality. Um, now, now, why do we call it the Burnside group? Well, uh, you look at uh, varieties of different dimensions, right? of dimension zero. So what is a variety of dimension zero? Well, it's sort of a field extension. It's an extension of a ground field. Okay, 
And uh, what is it parameterized by? Well, that's a finite index subgroup up to conjugation in the Galois group of the ground field. Okay. Uh, then we saw, okay, well, how do you characterize or what do you, how do you introduce, how do you call something that's about conjugacy classes of subgroups in a group? So that's how our term Burnside group uh, came about. So recently I was looking at papers of Clark Barwick, one of your colleagues, and so he talks about like Burnside categories or something anyway. So now, uh, so the application of these uh, uh, different uh, specialization ideas and techniques that go like this, you look at some family, uh, the special fibers, uh, you know, are allowed to be somewhat singular. Uh, and uh, what sometimes happens is that while sort of known obstructions to rationality or stable rationality for the generic fiber are trivial, in the special fiber, sometimes you pick up obstructions. Uh, sometimes it's a brow group, sometimes it's something else. Uh, and so, uh, well, if you have a general theorem that says that rationality or stable rationality specializes, this is a way to show that like a very general fiber is not rational or stable rational. So that's the idea. Now, uh, then comes the implementation. So here, I just wanted to list some results that I actually spoke about uh, in your department at Edinburgh uh, some years ago. Uh, we looked at conic bundles over rational surfaces. We also looked at Delpezzo vibrations over curves. And then finally, we looked at the final three folds. And the bottom line is that if we have a variety that's not rational, not birational to a cubic threefold, uh, and if it's very general and it's family, then it's not it's stably rational. So that was the outcome of these studies. And in particular, uh, that sort of settles the stable rationality uh, problem over the complex numbers in dimension three. And I say essentially, of course, we don't deal with, with all possible varieties and there's still you know, a lot to be done. But uh, in, in particular, the big uh, unknown is uh, the case of uh, cubic threefolds. But um, um, anyway, so that's a progress. Another thing that uh, uh, became accessible with uh, this technique is showing that rationality is not a deformation variant. You can get uh, families of varieties with rational and non-rational fibers, smooth families. So that was something that was also unknown. And there are many, many more results by others, Totaro, Schreider, Rikes, Otto, Schindler, Colette Delen, many, many others. So, uh, so once we understand the situation of the complex numbers, uh, we would like to uh, study the situation of non-closed fields. And so one of the first cases of geometrically rational threefolds is in the section of two quadrics and P5. And uh, well, of course, if you don't have rational points, you can't be rational. It's easy to show that if you have rational points, then this threefold is unirational. And uh, well, the uh, rationality criterion emerged in work of Brendan and myself, Benoit Wittenberg, uh, over you know, any non closed field. So uh, this threefold is rational if and only if uh, it contains a line uh, over the field. And more uh, or subsequently, because it's often Prokhorov extended this to other geometrically rational final threefolds, Frank Picard one, and I heard recently a talk by Kudensov, there is more progress in this direction. You know, there are some others, and Brandon and I also covered some other family of degree 18. In any event, um, so this is understood. Now, uh, the question of the arithmetic sort of question, the question of density of rational points on final three folds. Well, it's not completely set settled uh, because there are some three folds that are not rational, known to be uh, unirational, but uh, 
not all of them, like not all quartics are known to be unirational. In fact, you know, it's very much open. Uh, are there examples that are not unirational? But even without that condition, uh, it's sometimes possible to show that rational points are dense. Now, uh, I also wanted to mention another family uh, of uh, final threefolds. Uh, this time, a double cover of P3, not P1, not P2, but P3. Uh, and uh, if uh, that uh, ramification, that surface of degree six, uh, you know, has any speciality, then uh, Chelsea and Park proves that the points are potentially dense. But the general case is still open. So to summarize uh, kind of this part, uh, you want to think about the Afantan equations? Well, it's uh, you know, necessary or it's the correct way, the right way to think about this is to uh, look at you know, geometry, introduce geometric ideas and techniques into the picture. Uh, one of the central questions uh, in higher dimensional geometry or the complex numbers but also over non closed fields is a study of rationality. And uh, uh, I want you to take away that there's been you know, very rapid progress in rationality questions using this uh, idea of specialization due to Vazan and Kolyotolan and Pirutka. Uh, and uh, uh, well, so that's that part. Now, I also wanted to talk about some uh, recent developments, uh, uh, you know, recent works uh, jointly with uh, Maxim Kuntsevich, Brevin Hassett, Andrew Crash, and uh, uh, there the topic is equivariant geometry. So uh, when we study geometry, we can look at geometry over non-closed fields, or we can look at geometry over closed fields, but in presence of group actions. So in one setup, of course, you work on a non-closed field, but you always allow yourself field extensions uh, to ensure that some special loci are defined or to simply make possible some birational transformations. And then you would like to understand uh, can you get you know obstructions to doing these transformations of the ground field from the Gallo symmetry, the Gallo action on let's say the set of loci to be concrete uh, on you know the action of Gallo group on lines on cubic surfaces. So uh, and uh, uh, so that's sort of the role of a Gallo group. And when you look at geometry in the presence of group actions, it's kind of very similar because you want to understand birational maps uh, so that the action is uh, kind of preserved or that the birational map is compatible with the action that you look at. So the varieties themselves may be birational, but the map, uh, the birational map that does it may not be equivariant. So that's, of course, not a new question. There is, again, an extensive literature on this uh, topic. Uh, in particular, classification of conjugacy classes of, let's say, finite subgroups of the Cremona group. So even for P2, they were, um, I mean, until recently, the classification was just recently com completed by, um, you know, Many, many people and uh, um, so, uh, okay, there are differences I should point out. Uh, for example, you have a line defined over your ground field that necessarily has rational points. So you have a line that's uh, fixed by your group that doesn't mean that there are points on this line that are fixed by the group. So there are some, some other differences so that if you have a result in one situation, you don't necessarily have a result in another situation. Nevertheless, it's uh, kind of important to keep in mind that there are these two areas and that there are close links. And in fact, 
this was well understood. The uh, you know, papers of Manning and Oskowski, the early papers on, on, on petzo surfaces or on those fields, uh, the papers uh, are entitled G surfaces. So G could be the Gallo group or the symmetry group of the surface. A very inspiring book, recent book on these kind of questions is by your colleague, uh, Ivan Chelsov, Konstantin Shramov. And in fact, I read it with great pleasure. Um, so uh, once we kind of started thinking about rationality, or abstractions to rationality over uh, non-closed fields, uh, and we had these specialization results, I kind of was very naturally led to consider uh, questions of specialization, perhaps, or you know, of invariance for varieties uh, with group actions. And so, uh, and Maxim and I started discussing uh, the notion of equivariant Burnside groups. And so this is what emerged. So let's look at the simplest case. Uh, let's say we have a finite abelian group, even a cyclic group acting on, let's say, a smooth projective variety of dimension n. Now, a priori, you could consider you know, birational actions, but of course, we know that if you, you know, pass to a suitable model, you blow up equivariantly, uh, you can make that action regular. Then uh, we can look at uh, sub varieties in X, uh, uh, loci fixed by the action of the group. So fixed point uh, stratification. And uh, we can uh, look at the action of uh, the group in the tangent space. So we pick a point on one of those of alpha and look at the eigenvalues of our group G. If G is Z mod P, it's just roots of unity uh, in the tangent space. So if an n-dimensional variety, we get n uh, residues mod P. So an unordered n-tuple of characters. And so, well, the invariant that we want to produce is simply this. You take your variety, you look at the stratification, and you uh, assign to it a sum, a finite sum of uh, these uh, an unordered n-tuples. And they're unordered because, well, you don't know which eigenvalue comes first. You just have a vector space and uh, doesn't have a distinguished basis. Now, this is supposed to be an invariant. So under equivariant, uh, blow-ups. Now consider such an equivariant blow-up and impose relations uh, on these formal sums of symbols. And the relations are precisely this. We don't want the invariant to change under G equivariant blow-ups. And the equivariant peak factorization established a couple of years ago says that in fact, every birational or equivariant birational map can be factored uh, as the sequence of blow-ups and blow-downs of this type. And, uh, uh, well, a priori it looks, uh, you know, messy because, you know, you're blowing up sub-varieties. How do you formalize this? But it turned out that it can be formalized uh, in a very straightforward uh, fashion. And, of course, the results that I'm going to show you emerged after you know several intermediate steps, but this is what this invariant group looks like. So consider the Z module B n of G generated by unordered tuples of characters of your group G with the following two conditions: the generation condition that uh, the uh, the characters that show up here they span A. In other words, not everything is zero. And this is sort of not very relevant, but the most relevant is a blow up uh, relation. And it goes like this. So for all uh, A1, A2, and then B1 up to Bn minus two, we have the following relation, A1, A2, and then all the others is equal to A1 minus A2, A2, A2 plus A1, A2 minus A1. If they are different, and A1 zero if they are the same. 
Now, of course, you see this for the first time and you think, wait a minute, it looks like case theory. It looks like, you know, you have these relations uh, like involving only two entries. Well, it's not, I mean, it's something, but uh, oh, this is what it is. And then the theorem is you do what I told you, take your variety, look at the fixed point stratification, record eigenvalues and tangent space, uh, write this invariant. And the theorem is that the class in this uh, BN of G is a well-defined G equivariant by rational invariant. So, okay. Uh, we've looked and, and I will tell you later a little bit more about what you discovered looking at these groups and so on and so on. But I mean, here is a geometric in, like, invariant that emerged. Now, there is also a variant that you can introduce. You can introduce an additional relation where uh, you kind of pass the sign on one of the entries. So A1, A2 is equal to minus, minus A1, A2. So later it will be clear why this is sort of relevant. And uh, sort of the computation shows that the classes of projective space with the linear action of a cyclic group uh, is uh, torsion in B and G. So if N is at least two and uh, the class is trivial in B and minus G. So, so here is a way to distinguish a linear and like a cyclic action on some variety from a cyclic action action on a projective space of the same dimension, if the dimension is at least two. So Andrew Crash and I uh, uh, introduced something more general. Uh, so let me explain this first uh, for abelian groups. Uh, so we introduce the equivariant Burnside group as follows. Uh, it will be generated by symbols uh, with three entries one of the entries is uh, a subgroup of your abelian group G. Then you have an action of G mod H on some algebra. So you have a Galo algebra. And then you have some beta, which is a faithful N minus D dimensional representation of H. So let me unpack this. Let me explain what it means. So uh, you look at uh, sub varieties uh, with generic stabilizer H, you have an action of H in the normal bundle and you record this action under beta, this is a beta. And then you also have an action of G mod H on the function field of your uh, locus. Uh, respectively, that part can be translated, it can be moved around and this is what this G mod H action on the scalo algebra stands for. And there are blow up relations that are somewhat complicated that are not that complicated. And the group that you get is the equivariant Burnside group. All right, so let me discuss the uh, kind of model where, where this is on, on which this is computed. So after equivariant blow ups, we may assume that the variety is projective and smooth, that on some the risky open subset, uh, the group G X freely, that the complement is a normal crossings divisor, but in addition, uh, for every element in the group and every irreducible component of uh, the boundary. So either that element preserves the component or when it translates it, then the intersection between the translate and the component is empty. So we do, what we don't want is the following situation. You take the affine plane A2 and the coordinate cross and the Li2 action exchanging these two. So that's not a good action. That's not a good model. You have to blow up. So on such a standard model, uh, which in fact was introduced by Rice, Stan, and Yusin, uh in, in their work. And uh, you, know, you can always arrive at the standard model after equivariant blowups. Uh, on such a model, uh, we define an invariant 
of uh, x as the sum over all subgroups of G. Uh, then the sum over all strata uh, with the generic st stabilizer this is H. And then there is this collection of eigenvalues of H. You remember everything civilian, collection of eigenvalues in the, uh, in the normal bundle. And then there is a G mod H action on the function field. And that is a G birational invariant. Of course, this is how we made relations uh, between those symbols. And in fact, what we do is we also define this for non-abelian G. Uh, there's a difference is that uh, the sum is not over all subgroups of G, but rather over all abelian subgroups of G up to conjugation. Uh, and uh, uh, you know there are more complicated things, but it's, it's, it's sort of spelled out and defined. And then we prove specialization in this context. So in other words, if we have um, uh, a family of varieties with G action uh, over DBR, uh, then, you know, if, uh, if they were G equivalently rational or the generic uh, point, then under some assumptions on, on the singularities of the special fiber, the special fibers are also G equivalently rational. So again, in the work with Maxime, uh, we proved specialization over non-closed fields. Uh, so here it's specialization with G actions and they're not, they're not equivalent. They're just really different. So um, the, the results, I mean, under some circumstances, you might try to you know, go from one side to another, but uh, it's kind of a different theorem and a different proof as well. Okay, so these are abstractions. These are sort of new invariants, new definitions. Now uh, let's talk about applications. So cubic fourfolds uh, are very intensely studied by many, many people. Uh, uh, rationality of cubic fourfolds uh, is a big open problem. Uh, some are known to be rational, those with uh, two disjoint planes, for example, or, you know, containing some other uh, rational surfaces or configurations of rational surfaces. And um, there are sort of deep conjectures uh, linking the rationality over C uh, to uh, you know, properties of the direct category uh, of uh, these varieties. Well, uh, so the invariants that I just described allow us to prove the following result. Let's look at this particular cubic fourfold that's rational and has an action of uh, Z mod six with the weights uh, written here. So in other words, there is no action on X zero, uh, X one and X two, no action here. And uh, there is an action on, uh, on, on the other variables. So for example, here X4, uh, the action you know, has weight three, so you take square, so that's C mod six, so there is no action on this monomial and so on. All right, so here's this particular fourfold. And uh, uh, the result is that it's not G equivalently but rational to P4. So, uh, how does our invariant apply in this situation? Well, we are supposed to look at subgroups of this abelian group, non-trivial subgroups like Z2, Z3. So there is one Z3 uh, and the thing that's stabilized by Z3 is actually a cubic surface. So, and it's quite clear how you get a cubic surface. So you have this fourfold and then, you know, some, some of the hyper, you know, Okay, so two high two x four x five have to be like maybe this and this have to be zero or something. Now uh, that cubic surface uh, has still an action of z two, so that's a g mod h. So this is h, this is g mod h acting, 
And that action fixes an elliptic curve. So we know that the cubic surface is a Zemo 2 action that fixes an elliptic curve is not equivariantly stably uh, birational to P2. So, uh, and that's because uh, H1, Zemo 2 acting on the Picard happens to be, uh, in this case, Zemo 2 is non trivial and this group cohomology is an abstraction. And so when we look at the corresponding symbol that we're supposed to enter into this formal sum of symbols. So the symbol has a Zemo 3. So this is a stabilizer of this cubic surface. There is a Zemo 2 action on the function field of this uh, cubic surface, which then further stabilizes an elliptic curve. And what's essential here is that beta, the weights on the normal bundle are chosen in or happen to be uh, such that the corresponding symbol in the burn side group, burn four for uh, Z mod six is actually non-zero. And there are, the, there are no other symbols. Uh, I mean, this symbol doesn't interact with anything else. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, the class in this burn four of this fourfold, this, this action is non-zero. And so you know that it's not, uh, it's not birational to, um, to be uh, to, to be four. So uh, that's a, a statement of the kind of theorem, but uh, given our sort of understanding or our aspirations uh, regarding you know rationality of cubic fourfolds, uh, it raises sort of interesting questions. You see the abstraction here. It comes from hyperplane sections only. So there is a cubic surface, which is, uh, you know, hyperplane class squared. There is an elliptic curve, another hyperplane class, while the abstractions to rationality that are being sort of considered over C uh, are focused on, on other classes, on those other classes in like the middle cohomology not uh, you know things coming from the hyperplane class. So it's kind of mysterious to to me and you know to Brandon and to me how this abstraction that we wrote down here, uh, how it interacts with uh, that uh, K3 category that's in there somehow. And uh, anyway, so this is, worth exploring, I believe. But there are more examples in our uh, recent paper that's you know, appeared on archive quite recently. Uh, we have more and more examples for other actions, but this, I think it's kind of interesting application. Now, uh, so let me talk about uh, the structure of these uh, groups. Uh, uh, as we were playing, experimenting numerically with these BNGs, we discovered, you know, first of all, simplifications of defining relations that, you know, led to, you know, other considerations. So uh, here is one simplification rather than, uh, so we're looking at the Z module, which we call MNG for Motivic, generated as before by unordered tuples of characters of G, G is a billion, uh, where the generation condition is still in place. And where that blow up relation is slightly simpler. In the previous case, we had, well, if A1 is not equal to A2, then it's this relation. And if A1 is equal to A2, then it's a little bit different. So here it's uniformly just this. It's easier to program. So then, of course, uh, you want to compare. So there is a map from Bns to Mns. And the map does nothing, it just changes the bracket if all of the entries are non-zero. If one entry is zero and the others are non-zero, then you multiply by two. And if two entries are zero, then you map the thing to zero. And you extend this to um, 
by by linearity. And of course, you have to prove that what you defined here is well defined. It in fact, respects the relations as homomorphism of abelian groups. We proved that, and uh, I, you know, we also recently proved that it's actually an isomorphism tensor Q. All right, so let's uh, look at this you know, small dimensional B1s. B1 is M1, and it's simply all residues mod N, uh, all A mod N that are you know, co prime to N. So that's Z mod N star, and that's our group, B1. So what is B2? So B2 is, let's say, the group G is Z mod P. P is a prime. So generated by symbol, so you want A2. Uh, so that not both are zero mod p. Uh, well, you can exchange. And then you have this relation, a a is a zero. And what is a m2? Well, m2 is the same, where instead of a a is a zero for the b2, you have a a is two times a zero for the m2. So the, one of the reasons for introducing these M groups is that uh, they admit a lattice theoretic interpretation. And once you have, what I mean lattice theoretic is uh, you can uh, represent uh, those uh, you know, symbols uh, or you can extract the group MN from uh, in the language of a lattice, a simplicial cone of full dimension in this lattice, and the homomorphism from your group A, uh, maybe to the lattice or from the lattice to A, there are two versions. And then uh, once you have kind of a lattice theory presentation of your group, you can define hack operators. But of course you can also totally ignore what's in the background, lattices and cones, and you can just write down formulas. And so you write down this formula and well, it's a heck operator. And for every prime, you write down you know, similar formulas and that gives you kind of a very large, uh, you know, system of commuting operators of these groups. And I just plotted here for you uh, eigenvalues in some specific cases. So you can look at the structure here, you know, the other distribution and then you, you ask yourself, you know, what, what is all of this? And so then we started looking at, uh, you know, structures coming from, you know, Z mod N, you know, what about N1 and 2 dividing N? So there are actually operations, multiplication, co-multiplication on the M groups that we introduced. And once you have such operations, you can look at sort of the primitive pieces, namely the kernel, uh, from n going to you know all the other things that you can get when you look at uh, you know subgroups and quotient groups, uh, and you look at sort of all flags. And so here the minus you can do this uh, in for for two versions for the m version and for the m and minus version, but similar to the minus version that I introduced before. And so, okay, the, for M1, you don't get anything, but uh, for M2, uh, you get something. And then the theorem that we proved in the paper with Maxime and Pistoon is that uh, actually you have this decomposition as a direct sum of your group M and G into these primitive pieces. So you sum over all Rs, where R is the number of partitions of your N, you sum over all flags in your group, and then you look at these corresponding quotients and da 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 da, da. And so this is what you get. So once you have this decomposition, you understand that you need to focus on the primitive pieces. And so what happens is that actually the primitive pieces, the dimensions are, uh, you know, dimensions for the space of cusp forms for uh, gamma one N. So, the way we discovered this, we started computing with uh, B2 of Z mod P, and then we find that the dimension is uh, uh, something like uh, 
I don't know, p squared minus one over 24 plus one. Like we saw the 24, in a minute, 24. How do the rational invariant groups know about 24? And so then we started, you know, digging and digging and uh, we come full circle. You see for the uh, primitive, uh, like M3 primitive, we find that this is actually a number of certain cuspidal automorphic representation for some specific congruent subgroup of GL3Z. And then uh, experiments and also theories and conjectures in cohomology of arithmetic groups, they say that there is actually nothing else for NB equals four. And so the conclusion is that you can compute the Q ranks of these groups MN and by this recent comparison with BNs, uh, also Q ranks of the BNs, uh, using just the Euler function, the number of things that are co-prime to N, uh, genera for uh, modular curves, X1 of N, and some, some other mysterious dimensions uh, for, the, in, for very specific N, you know, 43, 59, there are some jumps over uh, the, the formula that you have for M3 of Z mod P, which is, uh, um, you know, the, the previous one minus P minus one over 24. So, okay, so, uh, uh, and uh, again, no primitives uh, by computer for all N up to 242, it's computationally very, very expensive, you know, when you try to make these ranks. So to summarize, so there are sort of new invariants now in birational geometry, covariant birational geometry, uh, either completely arithmetic, just uh, uh, residues mod P, if you like, and you know, symbols made from these and relations, and those link to automorphic forms, or you can upgrade these uh, including information about uh, function fields of uh, strata fixed by subgroups of your abelian subgroups of your G. Uh, so uh, it's kind of interesting to understand or try to understand how these new invariants couple to what is known already, namely, for example, to H1 G acting on Picard or uh, you know, some other homology groups or to the derived category uh, invariant uh, in the case of cubic fourfolds, for example. So all of this, I think, you know, needs to be explored. But uh, if you forget sort of the geometry and just focus on the invariants, you realize that uh, there is a very intricate internal structure. And uh, you know, together, what we see is sort of a very unexpected connection between geometry, like over the complex numbers and presence of actions of finite groups, and suddenly automorphic forms, transcendental functions, congruent subgroups. So, uh, well, and with this, uh, I want to you know, end and uh, for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Yuri, thank you very much. Let